Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Everybody, thank you for joining me here at Stars of Cabernet Night 2. My name is Ian Blackburn, and uh, we're excited to have you all on board. We've got six amazing wineries. And uh, just a little uh, reminder to our wineries, we do ask that you keep your presentation to uh, under eight minutes. We're going to be moving along pretty quick. Uh, those six wineries, we're hoping to finish somewhere around an hour into our program today. So uh, thank you for helping us do that. Uh, we've got, also got a great charity in, on board, uh, Greg Gura. I'm not sure if you're in with us tonight. There you are, buddy. I'm here every night. Come on. Uh, in spirit, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us and thanks for organizing the silent auction um, Greg's going to paste that link into uh, our chat box so you can take a look the auction is open until tomorrow night um, it opened last night and people can uh, definitely get involved bid early the prices are really low right Greg yeah everything is uh, like we said we usually try to start at about 50% off but Crazy Ian said started off 75% off retail. So we have some active bids. I just want to thank uh, Kimberly and Lisa and Reed and Jeremy for their uh, generous bid so far. Yeah, get in there, get get outbid. I mean, that's part of the process is you help raise money every time you get outbid. And that's a really beautiful thing. We're, we give all the money from the auction to Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and we're hoping to get across $700,000 in the future. And uh, Greg, thank you for all your help for all the years and and uh, doing it just little pieces at a time. But uh, it's a great way to buy some holiday wine. You're gonna be drinking throughout the holidays, maybe some nice gifts. And uh, these are some awesome producers that we've got involved. And with their generosity, we're, we're gonna make some money for the charity tonight. Yep. And I know, Ian, you're offering uh, great discounts for, you know, regular uh, regular bottles. But on the auction, we have a lot of magnums, a lot of verticals, a lot of one-of-a-kind things, you know, a collector wooden boxes. So give it a look. And, you know, it's not just wine. We've got like 30 items up there, uh, some nice weekend trips to Palm Springs, to Arizona. So give it all a look. It's all at a great price and all goes to a great cause. Wonderful. And uh, thank you very much, Greg. Let's get it. Let's get some wine going in our glass and uh, get our our show started. And uh, just take a look around. Uh, we've got folks from all over uh, California. Um, someone even uh, viewing from Japan, Satsuko, always uh, viewing from Japan. Um, we sent some uh, wine to Texas. Uh, we've got uh, some friends in Pasadena. South Bay, Santa Monica, and uh, here and there. And um, of course, this is also being recorded. We have an extensive library of videos and all of our producers, uh, uh, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for getting involved. And we want all of you guys as uh, participants to you know, use us, whether it's at Merchant of Wine or our Wine LA website, uh, as a conduit to get back to these producers. Hey, I saw them on Stars of Cabernet. We're going to Napa. We're going to Sonoma. We're going to Monterey. Uh, I'd love to go visit some some people. And who do you recommend? We love to be that, that to be able to help you with your your wine journey. So uh, with that, let's get started on tonight's wine journey. And I'm going to bring in. Uh, Hopefully my PowerPoint is right there. It seems like every day there's a new update. It looks a little bit different, but uh, I think you can see that. And hopefully you got our, our beautiful uh, materials that our design team put together. Um, we we're very proud of the, the work we're, we're trying to put together, a very elite uh, online experience. Of course, we used to do this in person and we will again in the future. But uh, in this moment in time, uh, this, this product works out great for us to get together and we're gonna continue to innovate. We've got six great wineries. Here's the lineup. If you didn't get the tasting mat that was on that invite, you could print that out and download it as well as the brochure showing you the pricing and uh, information about the wines. But we're gonna go from Tambor Bay in the Napa Valley to Bernardus and from Carmel Valley to Atlas Peak 
to San Helena, to Howe Mountain, and to areas very close to Howe Mountain that we'll learn all about as we finish up our presentation tonight. And so there's a chat box down below. I would love to see the chat box just overflow with comments and questions. And honestly, we, we invite you to get on the screen and talk and ask questions. Uh, this is an interactive type of a deal. So uh, make this your own and have some fun. Uh, Terrence, what do you got, buddy? I got to unmute you, though. There you go. He used the hand raise feature. Terrence, that is the most, uh, this is the first time I've ever noticed it. It came right into the middle of my screen, um, but I can't unmute you for some reason. Why is that? Okay, just a, you know, this fabulous two nights, but just a shout out to the gentleman with his whole party there, Paul Coran. Amazing. I should, oh, could a wine snob passionate guy like me can not even think of something like that. Paul, you're amazing. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for the shout out. All right. <laughs> Get on to uh, chat and uh, make some friends. Um, I'm always I'm always envious of watching um, some of our guests enjoy chatting with others. I wish I could read all of your chats. Maybe I don't want to, but uh, um, we want to have some fun tonight and uh, bring it to bring, make it real. OK, so let's get started with Barry. Barry Waite is the own the vintner at uh, Tambor uh, Tambor Bay. And I'm excited to have you on the on the Zoom, Barry. Can I hear you, Barry? I don't hear Barry. He needs to unmute himself. Ah, okay. Barry, hit that un unmute button for me because I'm looking at the screen trying to find you. Oh, there you go. I see All right. It. All right, brother. You're golden. Ah, I am golden. Yeah, nice to, nice to see you. Hello, other vintners. Leslie, great to see you um welcome to the podcast if that's what we're calling this uh a pleasure to be here uh i'd like to spend my few minutes talking a little bit about tamber bay ian do you want to you have something you want me to power some noise in the background in. we got to, we got the power uh, in yeah bring it yeah, up bring it up Barry. yeah power in yes yeah, stop right there for just a minute uh you know uh what you're looking at is uh where our winery is located it's located in calistoga napa valley uh, this is called the Sundance Ranch. It's one of the largest uh, horse ranches in Napa Valley. And uh, so it really coincides what people saw on the logo of uh, we are a entity of both horses and wine. Uh, this Sundance Ranch was built in 2001. We acquired it in 2012. And what, what you're looking at right now is uh, where uh, all our tastings occur. This picture was taken without furniture. We took it all out, but it's just an extraordinary courtyard uh, with horses down both sides. Uh, it's just a, a, a fantastic uh, facility onto that. I've been in the business for 22 years. Uh, I am uh, uh, originally from San Francisco, Bay Area, came up here 22 years ago to uh, get into the Napa Valley lifestyle and started a wine business. And we've gone from 150 cases of wine uh, produced in 2001 uh, to just under 10,000 cases now for the Tampa Bay brand. Uh, we specialize only in French varietals and of course, if you're in Napa Valley, you make Cabernet. So I make three different Cabernets that uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, really go all over uh, the varietal map of how Cabernet can be made out of this valley. Ian, why don't you go to the next slide? I actually think you want to go to two more. Go one more, if you could. That one? That one more. Sure. It, it, but this is a, a fully operational, like you've actually got horses on the property now? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, there you go. This is why I wanted to show it. So what you saw was right in the middle. This is a 22-acre uh, a horse ranch. We have 17 irrigated pastures, uh, you know, big arena. Uh, a number of vintners also keep their horses at our winery. Uh, they're smarter than I am. They, they've taken all their land and put it into grape. I've taken some of ours and, and put it into pastures. Um, yeah, so it's a fully integrated process uh, as we do this. Um, uh, let's see, uh, where, where do we go? Let's, let's talk about this picture right here. Sure. This is uh, the Ducheveau Vineyard. Uh, I, we call it Ducheveau, which in French means two horses. 
And uh, it's named after that because the name Tambor Bay is named after my first two Arabian horses. This is a 60 acre vineyard in the very north side of the Yontville Vineyard. And you're looking east onto this, which puts you into the Vaca Mountains, which is really the extraordinary note about where our fruit comes from. Uh, these Vaca Mountains over the millions of years, I mean, they, they were developed you know, 30, 40, 50 million years ago. And over the millions of years of storms, all that beautiful soil from those mountains have come down into the, the base of uh, Napa Valley. And so we have just layers and layers of different soil types that these uh, vineyards go through. This is, uh, you're looking right into the Cabernet block uh, or blocks, plural, that uh, our fruit comes from. And, uh, and then if you go up a couple blocks, you will, or uh, pitchers, uh, you can actually see some of the fruit that uh, was out there this last year. So if you want to go up, uh, up, can you go backwards the other way? I can go backwards. There you go. Let's go up too. Yeah, those were, uh, this one I got I've got these yeah a little bit more I can't I can't um, go up like north on the on the photo or anything it doesn't let me go in that direction no just get one more picture up if you could because that just, just shows you some of the Cabernet that we're about to drink um, that's, this is what I got buddy and if you can't do it no that's it that's fine okay, I'm sorry yeah you can well so this is a um, you know our tasting notes matt and uh i think this is what you distributed to people so uh why don't you go ahead and uh, just come back to the live shot and uh we'll just do a little wine tasting here sure, onto man. this 92 points james suckling and uh uh you're at 60 how much what is your what is your suggested msrp uh for this particular vintage it is uh 60 that's a uh, incredible value uh, yeah, we've been told that. <laughs> we've been told that. This is the wine that I made. Uh, I made 50 cases of this back in 2001, and we've grown it to now 1,500 cases. It's all estate grown. In the early days, we used to put a little blender or two into it, a little Merlot, a little Franc. Uh, about five years ago, uh, through an aggressive replanting program of that vineyard that you saw, uh, I now grow seven different clones of Cabernet. And in this particular wine, this is, has four different uh, clones. Um, and so to the consumer, this is 100% Cabernet, but to us, we actually blend, uh, you know, the four different styles uh, of clones into this wine. Um, I love this wine. It's gotten very, uh, uh, you know, good ratings over the years, anywhere from 90 to 94. 2018 year was absolutely phenomenal. What I love about this wine, it's so wonderfully fruit forward, black fruit comes into the play, but still it's very soft and easy and approachable. When we started the project in uh, 2001, I uh, hired a young man from South Carolina. His name was Thomas Brown. Uh, Thomas has been with us in different capacities and still is today. My head winemaker, his name is uh, Derek Flegel, who is a Thomas Brown protege, but also worked under Heidi Barrett, Aaron Pott, Michelle Rolan. So we've got an incredibly talented crew, you know, running our program. This is only one of 16 different wines that we make. Again, all French varietals, and uh, we have four or five uh, different ones that are uh, either Cabernet specific or Cabernet based blends onto that. Uh, this particular wine is 18 months in French oak, uh, was bottled in June, um, you know, uh, almost uh, a year and a half after bottling. And uh, it is absolutely ready for consumption today onto that. If people visit, can we uh, hmm. talk you into a horse ride? Well, I don't know if you can talk me into a horse ride, but uh, we can certainly go meet some of the ponies. Uh, we've got some uh, world-class Arabian horses there. Uh, a year ago, uh, I'll brag a little bit, that uh, we imported uh, a Frisian from Holland. Uh, he's a stunning horse. He's professionally trained to be a carriage horse. Uh, but my wife, uh, Jennifer, who's an outstanding equestrian, uh, is moving that horse into the dressage arena. So one of the... Uh, things to do when you come to Tamar Bay is not only drink wine and we can also accommodate lunches and charcuterie and things of that nature, but we go out and we meet some of the ponies. And uh, I think it's a, a really uh, fulfilling experience. I'll tell you what, it's, it's a unique experience for wine country in general, not just for Napa Valley. I do encourage that people uh, get uh, appointments with us. Um, uh, we are appointment only and some days, especially the weekends, we're very full. So we should uh, suggest to uh, make your appointments in advance. Um, that's the name of that. Beautiful wine, Barry. So, 
so deep and saturated. And I'd love to get some feedback from the audience about the wine that's in the glass. Everyone's tasting. We've delivered samples to everybody. And uh, anybody, Fantastic. anybody have any questions for Barry? Barry, somebody's asking if you make a Cab Franc. Leslie, are you playing MC? That's good. Like it. Thank you. <laughs> we do. We do make a Cab Franc, and it's a very interesting one. Uh, the Cab Franc, uh, the name of the wine that we uh, use with Cab Franc is called Sabino. That is our name for the wine. It's actually a Cabernet based Bordeaux blend. So it's about 85% Cabernet Franc. And then we make it really interesting on the sides by putting a little Cabernet and a little Merlot into it. But you absolutely get that essence of Cabernet Franc. Uh, but all that wine, again, comes out of our Yonfield Vineyard. Uh, that one's hard to get, though. We only make about 150 cases. And uh, so you have to get on our uh, allocation list to make sure you get your, 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 your wines on that one. But it's a very beautiful wine. And let me just, in compliment to that, we have a wine called Tavero. So that was Sabino. Tavero is a Petit Verdot-based Bordeaux blend. Hmm. And uh, as you can imagine, that's not for the lighthearted, uh, but it also has some blenders into it, one of which is uh, the Cabernet Franc. And uh, I believe we also put Cabernet in that as well. So those are some of our specialty wines that uh, we have. Barry, thank you Coming very much. Winery, our, our, our first wine of the night, you got us off to a great start and uh, it's a beauty and it's $60. You can buy it directly from the winery tonight. The link is uh, going straight to the winery. So um, uh, look for the email that's coming into your email box any minute if it's not already there. And it will give you links to all the wineries and all of their offers. Uh, we're very thankful for Tambor Bay kicking off our evening, Barry. And I hope uh, you stick Thank you, Ian. And, uh, it's been a pleasure. Stick around and uh, t add some fire to the conversation, too. Leslie's going to need some support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much, and uh, let's let's see how our audience is doing. I'm going to let's see. Go to the gallery. There we are. And we are going to move into a wine now from the Central Coast, Monterey, Carmel Valley. Uh, we're going to go to Bernardus, and our host tonight is Dean. De Kurth, the winemaker. Dean, are you there, buddy? Oh, they uh, they sent me again. My name's Jim McCabe. Jim, the assistant winemaker. Yeah, we've seen you before. How you doing? <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, we we knew that there might be a, a, a player to be named later, and I'm glad it's you again. You did a great job. So let's, uh, thank you, Ian. Let's get you out there. Um, we uh, we we have a special treat for everybody. Um, you know, Bernardus has been involved with us for uh, many years and been a big supporter. We're a big believer. We yeah. want to diversify. Yeah. Somebody just say my name. I can hear you. Um, Bernardus has been a big supporter uh, of our events live and, and Zoom. And there's a lot of stories to tell about Bernardus. And, uh, and we love to show diversity outside of the Napa Valley as well. And so you are our Carmel Valley representative in the stars of Cabernet. And it really gives you a chance to see and taste something very different. And they even stepped up with a library wine. We poured the 2014 current vintage on the website. Current release is probably 16 or 17 now, right? That's right. And so we're, we're uh, going back a few years. And I love to talk about wines as they evolve and be able to see, you know, not only the way the color is reacting but also how much more complexity is being picked up in the nose and uh, this is really a result of good winemaking good and good uh, 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 oversight by the team here so uh, how long have you been with Bernardus? I've been with Bernardus for 12 years now um, I'm originally from Massachusetts and came here for graduate school and got a job at Bernardus and been here ever since Fantastic. I was going to say, you're the new guy. Yeah. yeah. 12, 12 years, new guy. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys tend to keep people around for a while. So thank you, Jim, for joining us. And um, um, I, I love the stories uh, behind Bernardus, too. You know, 
If you ever went to the Central Coast, they used to own the Rancho Bernardus Inn there. Um, Mr. Pond is a total bon vivant. As I, I coined him the Pond Vivant. I think I was the first to ever say that, right, Jim? Yeah, I think so. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Mr. Pond um, is from Holland, and he was a race car driver. Raced, uh, raced in the Le Mans races in the 1960s. Came to the Central Coast of California, loved Carmel, loved Carmel Valley, and uh, started a winery, a restaurant, and uh, and owned a hotel. And that that might look a little familiar because that's. Uh... That sits on some race cars, and uh, that's Mr. Pond and, and, and his family invested in um, rebuilding a lot of the uh, factories in Germany after World War II, and uh, that's that's where the, the, the shield comes from. Um, so uh, he's he's a fascinating character. Um, his family, his, he and his legacy are fascinating. Uh, he passed away just a couple of years ago and had a succession plan in place for the brand and uh, that's in full full effect now that's correct so we were bought by uh, another dutch company um they want to keep the mr pond's vision intact and and keep moving forward in the same direction and kind of trying to fulfill ben's dream mr pond's dream so here we are at the gates of the winery and you guys are um physically located in the Carmel Valley? That's right. So we're, we're about 25 miles inland from Carmel by the Sea, which people might be familiar with. Um, it's a very nice little town on the central coast of Carmel near Monterey. Um, we're about three hours south of San Francisco here. Well, let's blow everybody's mind that's sitting on the Zoom up in Napa Valley talking about their finished fermentations. You picked Chardonnay yesterday. That's right. So we had a presentation yesterday. I actually had to shut the Zoom off and go run it and um, process Chardonnay coming in. So we've had a very late harvest this year. Uh, that was our last Chardonnay, and we're still uh, picking cab right now. So we're in the process of making this year's Marinas blend, um, kind of as we speak. I'm actually still at work right now. I'm, I'm in the lab right now, as you can see. So <laughs> still, still working. They had to hire, find some help for you there, Jim. I know, right? <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have you call my boss. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, uh, to tell us about the facility here. Sure. So we produce approximately 60,000 cases a year. Um, the Marinas that you're drinking tonight, we've done 6,000 cases. We're primarily known as a Chardonnay and Pinot producer, but we do have um, 80 acres of different uh, kind of French Bordeaux style bridles planted on our state vineyards here. And you would consider this a, a Bordeaux style blend or a Meritage blend? That's right. So we have, it's going to be about half half Cabernet Sauvignon uh, filled in with Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc as well to kind of round out the, the, uh, the blend there. And the SRP is around $75. And as this wine sits, you know, here seven years of age, you can see how that purple has kind of given way to some softer, um, almost like uh, maraschino cherry nuances and some really nice, uh, uh, like orange peel in the nose. Some really interesting things are happening here as the wine's evolving. The wine's got a, just a great mouthfeel super smooth and curvy and really an enjoyable glass of wine yeah we should have some red cherry and dark plum notes and it will develop over the years um the tannins will soften it's becoming a very approachable nice older bordeaux style blend um that is a picture of those are cabernet uh, grapes that you're looking at right now um so we recently had a fire here last year, and you can see the top of the hill where the vineyards are. The, the fire came right down to our vineyard. It actually burned some of our water tanks and our fence, but luckily stopped there and didn't go any further. Wow. You know, you are, are traditionally a Chardonnay and Pinot brand, making Monterey County Chardonnay and Santa Lucia Pinot Noir. And um, so Cabernet and this Morena's wine is a something else that you do but it isn't your largest production 
That's correct. Yeah, this is a, it's approximately 10% of our overall production. Um, the wines themselves, the, they're harvested when they're ripe and our winemaker makes that call. Um, they're aged for 18 months in French oak, so we do about 50% new oak. Um, and then we usually bottle in, uh, in June um, of the year, you know, 18 months later after it's been aged. Well, um, I think uh, your brand is very dependable and uh, I would put your Chardonnay up against any California Chardonnay, your Pinot right up there. And this uh, cab is absolutely a star. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great blend. Really appreciate that. Yeah, the grapes are definitely uh, will look a little different when we pick them in this in this picture. We let, yeah, them, we let that, them ripen a little bit more. The picture, like what they look like in maybe June, early July. Maybe for you, it was uh, early October. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it does. It is a little cooler. We do have hot days, but um, we tend to have mild to cool nights. Um, so we we harvest a little later than they do up in uh, in Napa Sonoma area. For sure. How many total acres do you guys uh, farm? So we have, we have approximately 80 acres planted at this vineyard we're looking at. And then we have a couple other vineyards around Carmel Valley. But Marinas comes out of our uh, state vineyards. And yeah, there's um, let me look forward. Yeah, there's approximately 50 acres of cab and then other, other varietals planted at that same vineyard in different amounts. So. Well, thank you for uh, showing off the 2014. And uh, when do you think you'll be done harvesting uh, this year? What date? Um, probably the week after Thanksgiving is when we'll be putting the wines to bed and be finishing with, uh, with harvest. Um, fermentations may not be done until a week or two after that. So we have a, we have a long harvest here. This goes from generally the beginning of September through Thanksgiving. So. It's a, it's a long slog, but we're all, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel there. That's cool. Well, uh, say hi to the rest of the team for us, and thanks for being on the Zoom, and uh, get back to work. Well, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Ian. Be well, man. Be well. Thank you so all right. much. All right. So next, we're going to head back into Napa Valley. And... Uh, but before we do, let's just uh, check in with our audience and see how everyone's doing. Oleg, how are you doing, buddy? Good, I'm good. Actually, I have the Bernardos. Yeah. The 14. Very, very, very nice point. Oleg, you own a couple of restaurants. Yeah. Do, do uh, you have some nice big cabs on your on your wine list? I do. Yeah. But I drink it for myself. All right. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, because I know you get some good stuff. I don't know if it would hit the wine list or not. <laughs> cool. Um, awesome. Ralph, I see you there getting ready on the beach. Tal, we're coming up. All right. All right. Let's go back up to Napa and hang out with Tal. Um, Hi everyone, how are you tonight? Fantastic. I almost hit the wrong button, Tal. Hold on. Spotlight. There we go, buddy. Oh, there we go. Oh, well, that's a pretty sight. Um, <laughs> Alex, Alex apologizes uh, that he can't be with you this evening. He actually has been up at the vineyard where there is barely electricity on the top of Atlas Peak. Um, they have that, but but much, not much more. And a small little winery in a beautiful part of the world, but we do have a video with Alex and Alex is one of the most passionate individuals in my 30 years in the wine business. So I'll, I'll walk you through the wine after uh, we hear about uh, my boss. I'm his uh, chief cook and bottle washer. So I'm his uh, second whenever he uh, can't be there. That sounds good. Well, here's our video with uh... Alex Karachi. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. 
All right, now it's time to meet my good friend Alex Garachi. Alex, it's been a long time since I've seen your face, but you look well, my friend. It's been a long time, man. It's great to see you. It really is. You have uh, been such an industry pioneer in so many ways. Tell us, how did you get in the wine business, Alex? Well, you know, quickly, born and raised in Chile, I came to the U.S. on a soccer scholarship. I wanted to play professional, and then I got injured in my one of my last games in the playoffs, wow. playing for San Jose State, wow. and then graduated, and it was, I didn't know what I was going to do now because I wanted to play professional soccer. And I came up with this brilliant idea about introducing wines from Chile. So that was 36 years ago. I tell people I was 10, but they don't believe me anymore. <laughs> so it's then it was like Chile and Argentina, <laughs> and really I was very lucky to be a guy at the right, in the right place at the right time, even though it took me a long time to introduce wines from Chile and then Argentina. But I'm with uh, with uh, pride and being humble as well. I am I am the guy that introduced South American wines in the United States. That's amazing, man. Overnight success, right? 36 years. <laughs> to five years. <laughs> to five years. But little by little, one account at a time. But, it, you know, it worked. So I'm extremely blessed. Fantastic, buddy. Well, I, I'm very pleased to share your beautiful wine with our audience tonight. Uh, and let's get into the slideshow. Uh, here we go. Uh, we're talking about Garachi Family Wines, and uh, we've got the 2018 in your glass tonight. Yes. So, right. so from, you know, at many years ago, working with Paul Hobbs, and we were going to do something together that never happened. And one day, about 11 years ago, so let me see, 14 years ago, I told Paul, I want to start, I want to make wines in Napa and Sonoma. So he started making my wines at the beginning. And then in the past five years, um, I started working with, with Julian Gonzalez, which was his winemaker. But from the beginning, we were sourcing fruit from some of the best spots in Napa and Sonoma. You know, wine from, grapes from uh, Andy Beckstoffer and Gap's Crown. And, but always seeking for some of the best fruit. So be, because my goal was to make the best possible peanuts and cabernets in both, in, in both valleys. So, and that's how it got started. And then I was, um, it was interesting. I got some really good press and I was not able to get the same fruit the following year. So I, I decided, I said, the only way to really um, control and, and that my destination and really be able to uh, keep the quality wines was owning my own vineyards. I don't know that was a good idea or a bad idea. So I talked to the bank, the bank became my best friend and I was able to buy a vineyard. And my, that was my first purchase in, wow. in Sonoma Coast in Paloma Gap. Outstanding. So you, where in uh, Napa Valley is uh, your, your vineyard exactly? So we are at the very top of Atlas Peak, you know, about 14 to 1800 uh, feet in elevation. Wow. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful spot, all red volcanic soil. We're right next to some of the big names like um, Antica by Antonori and uh, State Coach. Uh, so wonderful vineyards, great uh, production, great wines, great. And, and one of the things that it happen naturally, we get low yields in, in this area because it's all red volcanic soil. Uh, so big, rich, complex, wonderful concentration, uh, wines that are also very balanced. Because I really believe that in part of this part of the world here, in all the way up in Atlas Peak, um, you might, you gotta be careful because you might get uh, bitter tannins. So, and their wines are aged beautifully because of the tannins. But I think it's important that you tame those tannins and, and we do a really good job by doing that. Well, it looks like an optimal spot. Um, it is fantastic. I mean, I invite everyone that is watching this video to come in anytime and, and uh, visit us. It's all by appointment only. We're small, <laughs> but, but we will take good care of you guys. Fantastic. And I, I tell people this all the time. If you're going to Napa Valley, please contact me and 
remind me you're on this Zoom and we'll put you in talk talks with Alex and his team and get you an appointment there just to make it yeah. easy for you guys. Here's your so, tasting note. Yeah, so this is 2018 Metal Rock Vineyard State Bottle Wine. We are just about to release. Uh, <clears throat> I tell you, it's amazing. I, I think this is the best cabinet we made and uh, in Metal Rock. Uh, unfortunately, we only made 650 cases. I'm sorry, but it's so delicious. Mm -hmm. It's so good. It's so beautiful. It's so complex and rich. Um, Came from 20 year old vines, 21 actually. Uh, 21 year old vines at this at this as is best right now. Um, we're getting great, great uh, ripeness and. Uh, and then we pick a night, it's all Hanna sorted and um, it really low yields. We're talking about one and a half to two tons an acre. So there is that great concentration. It's so rich, so complex. Uh, we got some good ratings, 98 by tasting panel, um, 93 wine advocate, we just got a 93 from a wine spectator. I always said if my name was uh, Alex Harlan, maybe I get a 98. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, from one spectator, but I think you gotta taste it. You guys gotta taste it because what you see here is such a beauty. The wine is aged uh, 20 months in New French oak. Um, it's again, it's black fruit. Um, good, you know, just um, you can, I, I get uh, tobacco and and um, it's just wonderful flavor profile, a little bit of chocolate, uh, you know, and I think that you get so much for the money. It's not inexpensive, it's $95 retail, so you have to retail, you can get it for lower than that. But I think for the money, it's a wonderful, wonderful bottle of wine. Alex, I, I, I love your story. You, you've absolutely started with you know, ideas, you built everything yourself and you move into production here in California. Thank you. One of the lessons that every winery learns the hard way, unfortunately, we all, you know, the, jo the joke is how do you make a small fortune in the wine industry? You start with a large one and um, it's, it's a really expensive industry. It is. You come in, you get the lure of, oh, I get to buy this amazing fruit. Well, if you don't own the vineyard, they don't, they don't necessarily um, need to sell you that fruit year after year. Um, it's really hard to get even a contract that will go out, you know, and say anything more than you have the right to buy our fruit this year. Um, and so you made a really powerful move again, buying your own estate. And uh, this, the, the word estate means 100% or 95%, I think is what they require you to have from your your vineyard um, and that's a that's that's a great move for you and I really Thank hope you. that uh, you continue to grow and get um, get noticed from people you keep your prices in the right spot and um, deliver a really artisan product and I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, proud of you and proud to thank, have you. You thank you thank you fantastic uh, Alex I'll look forward to chatting with you more every 10 years or so we got to get together <laughs> you do. You know, seriously maybe maybe this time and you know a little bit of food a little bit of wine and that would be fantastic so we can catch up we have 10 years so yeah a lot to talk about you bet buddy well be well and thank you thank for joining our event and cheers to you i appreciate it thank you talk to you soon bye thanks super nice guy ladies and gentlemen oh, sorry uh, Tal, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm, I was on mute. Now I'm off. As Ian stated, uh, we're, we're tasting the 17. We're about to release the 18. Everything, the 17 is sold out. Uh, we made 1,200 cases of the 17 vineyard uh, vintage, and um, uh, we're around that for uh, the 2018 as well. Um, one thing about this wine is it is a hundred percent varietal. So if you talk about what is Cabernet and what are the classic notes of Cabernet, 
the florals in it, you know, start with violet and those light purple flowers that come down. If you if you uh, swirl this around and get your nose down in that glass, it wallops all the way around your head almost, and you pick up those florals. And, and then that earth uh, with the fruit, that sweet note. Uh, but these soils are super thin, smaller clusters, really concentrated fruit. Luckily, this is the same bottle that I had open yesterday. So it's really opened up beautifully after, after being open for a day. But uh, Mountain Napa Cab, this is the essence of what it is, um, the balance on this. And uh, Julian's winemaking, he practiced for 20 years with Paul Hobbs so he could make real wine now. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, once again, you know, that Bondi garage mindset, uh, you can make a thousand cases in your garage. So that's about what this is. You know, big companies break more wine than, than we sell uh, Cabernet for the most part. But uh, this is Alex's legacy and this is what he's worked so hard for the last 35 years for. So... Any questions? We're at $95 retail on this wine gang. And um, uh, although the 17 is sold out at the winery, the 18, something to look forward to. And uh, get up there and visit the Garachis and, and get to know a, a brand that's kind of in its, even though he's been doing this a long time, this is a brand that's still kind of in its infancy. And uh, you're going to watch this this brand continue to excel. The, the wine Absolutely. is delicious. Terrence, your hand is up on your screen. Is that supposed to be there? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I just, I'm blown so, away by this wine. I'm blown away. So it depends on the vintage. Uh, for the, when you talk about decanting, I taste the wine before I decant. As a psalm, um, my taste bins, you know, I haven't broken these out. We did a trade tasting yesterday and it's it's been 30 years since I've had that thing around my neck, but uh, the palate just keeps growing in that. So I would taste the wines and if it's for aeration purposes or for breathing purposes, aeration with big young Napa cab, uh, you could do it a couple of days in advance if you wanted to, or you could do it, you know, a few hours before, you know, depending on the temperature of your house, depending on time of year, if you keep it in a cellar, if you have a nice cellar, you can do it a couple of days in advance and it will mellow right down. But if you have it in room temp, I wouldn't do it too too far ahead of time because of temperature. I mean, I like drinking my red cellar temperature if you can get it. Uh, and it, too too warm is is a crime for wines of this caliber, I think. Tal, so let me, uh, let's uh, yeah. let the parents ask that question real quick. Well, you made a point, good point, drinking wines that are room temperature cabs are it's just it's difficult but uh, my question was going to be because this is i really really enjoy this wine uh, and i love paul hobbs as a winemaker and um and where is he he touches things and makes them better um well as far as the, the slope base on the on the vines you're up and out let's speak what, what what do you what what do you like as the optimum layout of your vines uh, west facing south facing what, they're south what, they're what, south what? facing about uh 43 to 48 degree uh beautiful sun exposure which is what you want for cabernet because you want to build those sugars you want to keep the photosynthesis above that 57.3 uh, degree fahrenheit that that keeps photosynthesis building sugars day and night so we have a lot more sun exposure than actually paul's vineyard which is uh, our southern border on the vineyard uh, abuts the stagecoach. And then right across the dirt road, which we call the street, is the Acadia Vineyard all the way at the top. If you saw that one picture, we're literally on the ridge top. The driveway to go up is down the road, and then you drive up the whole way uh, onto the property. It's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal um, for the concentration. But it's, it's, it's as good as it gets uh, if you're talking about Mountain Cabernet in California. I would say it's better than what it is. It's, it's phenomenal. Awesome. Thank you. So glad you like it, Terrence. And thank you, Tal. We appreciate your time. Yeah. And uh, thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, sir. We have uh, just, just begun our journey. That was wine number three. And uh, we are now heading up to San Helena to visit uh, with Leslie Russell, Leslie, are you out there?
Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> there you are. Let me put the spotlight on you. There we go. All right. Super great to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be a part of this tasting tonight. Um, I have a nice background at the winery for the Zoom call, but not at home so much. So, <laughs> <laughs> No problem. It's authentic. I'm not seeing your, uh, your slide, but... Um, let, me, let me get you into the slideshow and then you can get going. Um, yeah, so I'm the, I'm the general manager of St. Helena Winery. My name's Leslie Russell. And um, I'm gonna start with a very brief overview of the winery here. This is a picture over our kind of irrigation pond towards a, a freshwater pond over towards our uh, estate house and winery there. Um, we're a small estate winery in the Napa Valley located along the Silverado Trail. We are in the city of St. Helena, just the north part of that. And we're smack dab in the middle of the St. Helena viticultural region, the AVA there. Um, we have 13 acres of vines on our property and yep, mostly Cabernet Sauvignon. We have a little bit of Petit Verdot, less than an acre, a little less than an acre of Cabernet Franc and one row of Petit Syrah, kind of a legacy uh, from the former owner that is along a fence line there that we use for different things, um, but not this wine that you're drinking tonight. Um, we make about 1,000 cases to 1,100 cases of estate Cabernets every year. This is this one in particular, we made 350 cases of. Um, this is the 2018 estate Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, we've been making wine since the year 2000. Before that, we were grape growers only and just selling fruit. Um, we were selling fruit to some great Napa Valley wineries like Opus One and Quintessa and Maris. Uh, Mark Harold, the, the founder of Maris, uh, became the first winemaker of our wines for the first many several years until Aaron Pott became our winemaker um, in the year 2010. And he had been the former uh, winemaker at Quintessa and he was buying, when he was buying fruit from our, our property, he became familiar with it. And then he was obviously on the list of people that we, we might hire as a winemaker when uh, the people that I work for bought it in late 2009. Um, so Aaron now is our consulting winemaker. He no longer drags hoses and wears rubber boots around our winery, um, but he's got a stellar career. Um, he you know graduated from UC Davis a long time ago, back when I graduated from college. And, 1990 and then you know worked under John Kongsgaard at Newton in charge of the Chardonnay program. Uh, he's worked with Michel Roland, got him a job at uh, two different chateaux in Bordeaux. He worked in Bordeaux for seven years. He was uh, kind of the first American winemaker to be a Grand Cru Classe Chateau winemaker in Santa Emilion. He got his master's degree from the U University of Burgundy and he lives in St. Helena now with his wife and his two daughters. They make their own wine and it's called pot and then he's a winemaker for blackbird greer a, a multi you know, well not really too many there's probably about eight wineries that he's the winemaker for seven and stones and seven so stones. many yeah and so yeah he's been with us for a long time and just kind of consults with us now he's there often <laughs> giving us advice in the vineyard and giving us advice about pick dates and during harvest, looking at all our lab results and you know chemistry results and things like that and uh, giving us advice. Um, but the winemaker, the person who makes the final decision is Lindsay. Uh, she's pictured her name is Lindsay Wallingford and she is a very talented young woman who got her degree uh, in viticulture and enology from Washington State and then worked 12 harvests in the next 10 years going globe trotting, you know, up uh, northern hemisphere, uh, southern hemisphere. She's worked with Paul Hobbs, or he's been mentioned a couple times today. Um, she's worked with David Abreu, Michelle Roland. She worked at Screaming Eagle for a year and a half. She worked at um, Bryant Family right before we hired her. So she's brewed beer. She's made wine in Washington and Temecula and Oregon and, and New Zealand and Australia. She's, you know, we got a, 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 a nice breadth of experience, uh, but she's been with us since the very beginning of 2018. So this wine is part of the vintage. That was her first full vintage at St. Helena Winery. Um, next, next slide, Ian. Uh, you know, here's Lindsay and our crew. We have a, we have full-time estate crew. 
uh, a father, Javier, on the right, uh, he's got 44 years of winemaking or of, uh, of vineyard experience. He started when he was 16. So he, uh, he worked for Joseph Phelps for many years and he's been with us since 2003. Those are his sons there, twin sons, Luis and, uh, and Jorge. And so these, this crew led by Lindsay, um, and you know they they give us a lot of input of course from all their experience but they pass through our vineyard these 13 acres at least 14 times during the growing season doing the things that needed to happen in the vineyard everything is done by hand one vine at a time they know every vine individually and it's inevitable they're like in, you know they're like people and they they need individual attention and so that's the only way to give it to them is if you are not automated and you have somebody like you know crew like that touching them uh carefully throughout the, the growing season now, if you haven't had a taste of this wine please you know cheers <laughs> have a sip of the wine uh this is our 2018 estate cabernet um this is one of three three estate cabernets that we make each year and yeah uh, i noticed you said that it, it, it does mean it's 100 percent grown on our estate made at our estate aged on the estate, bottled on the estate. We have a mobile bottling truck that comes and does it for us, but um, we have full control over the wines throughout, uh, you know, from vine to bottle, basically. Um, the retail price of this one's $98. You know, the flagship wine is called Simpa. And if you happen to go to our website, that's the only one that's for sale on there right now, because we just like to have the flagship on there. Um, that's more, they, they get more expensive as you kind of move up from here. Um, and, you know, we, you know, this is a, this wine is the hallmark is a very approachable style. It's uh, which is based on our winemaking objectives for this particular wine and also the nature of Cabernet's grown in the St. Helena region of Napa Valley. We get lots of annual sunshine, consistent sunshine and, and heat. Uh, we're one of the warmest areas in the valley and um, so we get ripe fruit and the whole St. Helena viticultural region is on the valley floor. There's a little bit of bench lands, but it's not mountain fruit. This is valley, flo valley floor fruit. Um, it's largely the terrain, uh, um, you know, it's, it's flat with loam and gravel soils from alluvial fans that come off of the, the surrounding mountains. We're in a very narrow spot in the valley, our particular vineyard. Um, we are right against the Silverado Trail, which is right up against the Vaca Mountain Range. And we're very close to the Mayacamas Mountain Range too. So you got those alluvial fans that create the soil deposits and also the fluvial soil deposits from the Napa River, as you can see. Um, the north is kind of in the uh, upper right hand corner of our of this map here. This is a bit of an eye chart. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it is showing that, you know, the different varieties and and clones we have. So this is a this wine is a blend of seven, the seven clones of Cabernet that we have on this small property. Huh. Um, and it also has it's 90 percent Cabernet serving on this particular vintage. It's, the, sometimes this wine's 100% cab, but it's it's 10% petit verdot in this particular vintage. So, um, and, you know, the wine, what do the winemakers say about it? You know, uh, I have I have unfortunately uh, enjoyed my yeah. cabernet already. I've I finished it. It is toast, huh? Yeah. Well, it had I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you remember? <laughs> Did you write any notes? Um, no. You know, winemaker notes say fresh red cherries, fresh plum, shaved dark chocolate. There's usually kind of a cocoa dust, uh, you know, dusty kind of dry um, dark chocolate or cocoa uh, essence to this wine. Maybe a hint of vanilla bean. It's about 50% French, uh, new French oak every year, and 50% neutral. Um, our program has really come a long way away from 100% new oak um, for all of our wines, but this one in particular. There's a little gravel in your vineyard too, right? Yeah, there's an ancient riverbed that goes through part of the part of the vineyard where so those soils are you know are deeper gravelly and then but then we also have the the area that's closer to the river that's a little more fluvial in nature more sand and and clay composition and so we get a little more vigor in that area generally unless there's a drought which there is so everything's struggling now i mean we had a great harvest this year but and it was early i could not believe 
that Bernardus is picking Chardonnay right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Chardonnay picking this year earlier than ever, uh, like September 30th. So, um, and the berries were very small. So we didn't even do any Seigneur on it to make a rosé or to, you know, intensify the, you know, to increase the ratio of skins to juice in the tank, which we always do. We did not do it this year because the berries are so small. So everywhere on the vineyard, we had, you know, some uh, kind of a light yield where we did not get two tons an acre on our, on our vineyard this year. So we were, we're always shooting for two tons, <laughs> but we, we, you know, we're, we're a very low yield spot as well, which is very common in Napa Valley. Well, I, I did uh, pick up a, a lot of the gravel notes in the nose, which really kind of underlie the beautiful fruit. And there's a, a there's a tension that I always find in Aaron's wines that is a really uh, beautiful in the nose and kind of touches the line between Napa and Bordeaux. It has that kind of balance of earth tones and fruit tones and there's some really beautiful use of wood here. It's not not oaky, but just enough and just really nice daft, elegant touches to make this a, a beautiful San Helena estate wine. It's very signature and uh, I, I really enjoy it. I drank the whole damn glass. I'm not supposed to even drink anything. Uh, it's very, very easy drinking. Somebody's asking, Terrence is asking why 10% Petit Bordeaux? Um, well, that's completely the winemaker's choice. So out of all those uh, clones of Cabernet Sauvignon plus the Petit Verdot and the Cabernet Franc that they choose from with blending, they have press wines and free run juice wines. They have different barrel groups that they put these wines into. So they end up with about uh, the winemakers when they sit down in like January of um, on a normal year next year where they won't be blending anything because we did not make red wine in 2020. Um, but you know, January this year, they sat down, started doing pre-blending and, you know, they just kind of try to put, well, we make the grant, they, their priorities are kind of starting at the top of the portfolio. This is not the bottom of the portfolio, but it is, you know, um, a little bit of a trickle down, but they, they're trying, usually Petit Verdot to answer your question is added in our blends to lend a little complexity, of course. Um, it has kind of nice fresh blueberry notes to it um and some tannin and some color you know so just a little more intensity um in certain years when cabernet turns out to be very intense um you know cabernet sauvignon i should say then you know petit verdot becomes a smaller part of the blend um the you know like our simpa our, our flagship wine cabernet always has a little bit of petit verdot in it you know the only time we ever had 10 percent was the 2011 vintage when it was kind of not when it needed some oomph to it. So um, I, I, I find the Petit Verdot to not be overpowering in this one. I don't really detect it that much, but I'm not usually that um, sensitive to, you know, the subtleties of things like that. So that's why. <laughs> Ralph, Ralph Hartlandy was commenting about some floral notes. And I wonder if that may also be kind of leaning off that Petit Verdot. And well, certainly the blend just kind of helps everything kind of accentuate itself when it's blended well you really can um it's kind of like uh, using a mixer board kind of control the highs and the lows and, and it should be seamless right like a good dj right too just kind of um that it's amazing to watch the winemakers put the blends together um i've watched i've worked for bigger wineries and watched them, you know, put 150 sample bottles of wine on you know, a huge spreadsheet all over the, the, the wall. It's, it, it is amazing to uh, see the artistry and the, the talent and the experience really shines in that part of it. It's not really the science part, that's the art part to it. It's, uh, yeah. So every, every vintage is a little bit different. Well, sure. I really appreciate you joining us because we love having, you know, brands that, uh, you know, maybe we can we can even get, get some people to come up and visit you, so you can really feel you know the impact of uh, stars of Cabernet and and making some new friends and getting some some new bodies to come and see you. That's my goal. Sure. Um, yeah. I really, I really hope that you guys will take us up on that. And uh, Leslie's always been so great to us. I've known Leslie for uh, many years, and she's been super supportive and helpful and. And so I, I'm really thankful that you showed off your gorgeous estate wine in this lineup. And it's and it's absolutely beautiful and so gulpable. I just gulp, 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 gulp that, that thing down. 
Well, thanks. And just about visiting. I mean, we're technically closed to the public, but we're available for visitation by referral only. And you can consider this an invitation by me to you um, to come experience the estate and taste our wines with us. Um, you basically, you know, we're on the, on the house porch veranda. It's very relaxing and private and quiet. You're the only ones on the estate, only one party at a time. So, and it's, you know, valley floor looking up at two different mountain ranges. It's gorgeous and, and it's, a, it's a pretty place. So anyway, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you in Napa Valley. Thank you so much. All right. Fantastic. Well, we are now going to uh, head just a little bit to the east and upwards into the Howe Mountain area. And let's see. I think I saw Sean Capio. Head name. to the hills. Yeah, head for the hills, exactly. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> All right. How are you, Sean? Not too bad, not too bad. Enjoying all these wines. Great lineup of wines, really delicious. You know, glad to be here, glad to taste all these wines. I, I, I enjoy participating in these because I, I feel like I'm, you know, uh, one of your customers as well. And I get to try all these wonderful wines because there's so many wines in Napa, you can't get around and try them all, although I have had a lot of these wines, but great anyway. So. Great to be uh, be here and share some Powell Mountain wines with you. Fantastic. So now we're we're tasting the 2018 O'Shaughnessy uh, Howe Mountain Cabernet. You make a couple different wines under the O'Shaughnessy label. And yeah, the- yeah. So we so our, our flagship wine is is our Howe Mountain, um, or it's it's our we have two appellated wines. We have our Howe Mountain wine, which is where the winery is, and our original wine, and then we also have a Mount Vitor wine. And we make a Napa Valley uh, Cabernet, which comes from our estate vineyards, uh, Howe Mountain, Mount Beater, and Oakville. So some of the best appellations out there. And, and uh, so we're primarily a Cabernet producer. We do a little little bit of Chardonnay as well, but Cabernet is the game. Let me get you into your PowerPoint, which I, because I've been uh, drinking the wine a little bit too much, I may have shut down. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Here it comes. Let's see. Well, I'll give you a little history about the winery. Um, there you go. That's me at the winery. Um, Betty O'Shaughnessy, she bought the property in 96, uh, started planting vineyards in 97, uh, started work on the construction on the on the uh, winery in 2000, started digging the cave in 2000. Uh, took about a couple of years to dig the caves and then um, uh, started building the winery in 2002. And we're finished by 2004. So our first vintage is the 2000 vintage uh, from Howell Mountain. So the picture you're looking at now is down in our Oakville estate. So that's what uh, goes into our Napa Valley cap. That is the, uh, that's the Howell Mountain property. So we have 120 acres and 40 acres uh, under vine. Uh, You can see the winery there sort of carved into the side of the hill and the caves go in behind it. So just a gorgeous estate. We have, um, what I say, 120, 40 acres planted. One of the unique things about our property is that we grow all eight of the historic Cordova varietals. So whereas, you know, you, you're hearing other people say, oh, we, blow, we blend a little Merlot, a little Cabernet Franc, a little Petit Verdot. We actually have all eight varietals that were permissible in a Bordeaux blend back when they did the classification of the Chateaus in 1855. So we grow Cap Sauve, Cap Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and then we grow three of the very lesser known varieties uh, Carmenere, which is still permissible in Bordeaux today. We grow a variety called Saint Macaire and another one called Groverdo, which are which are pretty much lost varietals and really cool to have and fun to play around with. So our Howe Mountain blend, the one you're trying today, this is this is a blend of uh, it don't it doesn't always get all these varietals. We we do our blending trials and see what's best to make the best wine possible. Um, this one I believe has seven of the eight so so almost all all of them it's it's always variety cabernet so we're usually in that 80 percent cabernet um uh, range and then i think the blend is on one of these these spreadsheets i can't remember all of them after 20 plus years they start to get jumbled but it's uh um it's fun playing with all those varietals because it's sort of a spice rack so one of the, the picture you're looking at now is a part of our vineyard so that uh, we call it the amphitheater section because it forms sort of a natural amphitheater there if you see it um uh our original piece up there is, is the uh, is our Del Oso vineyard. We had some bears that were roaming up there. We're at 1,800 feet elevation, sort of right in, in the smack middle of the Howell Mountain AVA, and that's on the it's on the Vaca Range as people are, are mentioning. 
and we're, 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 we're south facing on the eastern side. Uh, there's the blend. So if you I have to put on my glasses to read this one, but yeah, so 83% Cab and 5% Merlot, 4% Malbec. We got a little Petit Bordeaux, a little St. Macaire, as we call it affectionately, St. Mac. Uh, Carmenere's in there and Cab Franc. So you've got a little bit of everything. It really gives us a great complexity and really um, uh, makes it sort of a signature style. So for, for all the years we've had, um, vintages we've had up there, we've had really complex blend as opposed to say our, our Mount Vita wine, which is 100% uh, Cabernet. So you can have like a varietal characteristic where we had a great um, showing of some varietal Cabernets in, the, in this lineup here. And then you have this sort of very crafted blended wine that's still varietal Cabernet, but. Hmm. It's gorgeous. And I love that you're using some of these ancient varieties. Are, how many how many producers in Napa have i mean how many acres of same we care are there <laughs> oh, okay. yeah zero you look you look in uh you look in the wine bible and, and it's under saint mccare it's like o'shaughnessy in, <laughs> in napa valley and the only <laughs> one's crazy enough to grow this varietal <laughs> wow cool we've actually given some cuttings to some other wineries it's a really cool varietal and you, and you start to look back at the history of why some of these varietals were no longer no longer used in bordeaux and some of it is you know their their later heart their later ripening varietals they're a little more uh, disease prone, you know, to, to powdery mildew, uh, downy mildew, those types of things. Um, they're 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 lower yielding, so they they can be troublesome in in uh, areas where uh, in Bordeaux where you can have some seasonal rains, things like that. And here in California, great agricultural state, it's always sunny. We never get any rain except for a couple of weeks ago, uh, so it's it's uh, it's easier for us to grow things. The picture you're looking at now is actually our Mount Beter Vineyard. So that's on the uh, Maya Camus range up around 1300 feet elevation. And that's a hundred percent Cabernet on that property. So that's why we make a hundred percent Cabernet from our, from our Mount, uh, under our Mount Veter Appellated wine. And it's our smaller one. So, so on Mount Veter, we have about 15 acres of Cabernet. So we, we produce about 1500 cases of Cab uh, from that really low yielding, very high, uh, lots of terracing there. Our Howe Mountain property, again, 40 acres planted. So we're producing 4,000 cases, uh, plus or minus, on a given year um, from our Howe Mountain property, from our Howe Mountain estate. And then our Napa Cab has grown quite a bit. So we have uh, we have another property on Mount Beter where we pull grapes for that. And uh, we'll probably produce about 5,000 cases of that. So overall, we're probably about 10,000 case winery. Still small, manageable. Yeah, that's great. And 21 years now, Sean? Yeah, 21 years I've been in O'Shaughnessy. Yeah, I mean, I've, I was the first winemaker there and I helped plant the vineyards, build the winery. It's been it's been a real privilege for me to, to be at one estate. You know, you don't see a lot of that um, anymore. You know, you get a lot of people jumping around. Um, so to really, you know, see the development, see the, the how the grapes have um, matured. So our vineyards, you know, our first vineyards on Howe Mountain were planted in 97. So we're, we're getting close to 25 years in age on the vines, um, which is bringing us into another arena of farming um and unfortunately you know a lot of vineyards in napa valley 25 30 years that's about the extent they get replanted because they want the production out of them um, when they get into that you know typically 30 years we talk about old vine is when you get into classification of old vine there's no legal status but um, you start to see a the yield start to regulate the, the canopy starts to um really find its its growth cycle so it's not as vigorous as young vines and then again, of course, the, the crop um, sort of regulates down and, and is much more uh, moderate yields from, uh, from our, say, our younger vineyards. So but the intensity there on the vines then increases. So that's why people are always seeking old vines, but it's really hard to find them. Wow. Well, you've got some uh, amazing riches to work with. Yeah, this is our newer vineyard right there. Sorry to interrupt you, but that's our, that's our uh, second vineyard on, on uh, Mount Veter, which we, we pull grapes for our, our Napa Cab from. Gorgeous properties. They're all mountain vineyards, except for our Oakville piece. Uh, all just really stunning piece of properties. And the and the, even the O'Shaughnessy property that you're making the wine at is just a, a beautiful winemaking facility. And yeah. so really a dedication to making some super high quality wines. And um, yeah, we're fortunate to have you know Betty O'Shaughnessy. She she invested the uh, the the money and the time to put into it, and and uh, and we're. we're we're plugging away you know we're now uh you know 20 plus years of making wine up there so it's it's great to, to have that history now beautiful 
in yeah. here. So here's here's the winery itself. That's our, if you do want to come and visit, this is our little hospitality area. We're, we're again, a small winery um, uh, by appointment only, of course, and as most of Napa is these days. Um, we have our little lovely glass wine cellar in the center there. Uh, there's some pictures of the cave and what have you. Yeah, that's our cave. One of our travels into our cave, one of the, the portals wow. uh, houses uh, some of our library wines, but also a bunch of uh, Betty and her husband Paul's um, library collection. So really some cool wines in there you can explore. <laughs> That's our, there's our cave. So we have 12,000 square feet of cave, uh, really stunning, really large travel that we have in the center. Uh, all the barrels are single high. So it's a real dedication to meticulous um, uh, winemaking and, and storage and aging and everything's very thought after. You still riding the skateboard? Every once in a while, you know, getting a little bit older, but yeah, it's an easy way to get back and forth without uh, <laughs> too much cardio. <laughs> Oh, cool, man. Great to see you again. And thanks for uh, showing such beautiful wine and, and participating. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a joy to have you here and thank you so much. My pleasure. Always, always happy to be participate. Well, awesome. We're just going to parachute off your property down the hill. Terrence, did you have a question? Cause you're a little. Oh, I did. I, I did. I thought I, my question, Sean was, how would you, you, we, we just tasted a really great wine from Powell Mountain. How, how would you, uh, how how much would the would the Mount Beater wine di differential be? I mean, obviously it's going to be a big differential, I would think. I wish right. we could have tried them both tonight. Yeah, for me, for me, the Mount Beater wine shows um, a lot more blue fruit. You know, because you're we're on our north facing side on on the Mount Camus range, so we get all the the cooler. Uh, morning sun, and then we get the hot afternoon sun sort of baking on the Vacker Range on the Howe Mountain side. So we get more of those, you know, rum raisin, dried cherry type characters on the Howe um, wines, where again, it's more of those bluer fruits and more lively um, uh, characteristics on the, on the, on the Mount Veter side. And then of course the blending then takes another level of uh, uh, change in the wine where you get I think, a little more complexity in the, um, in the Howe wines. But the Vitor wines, you know, for those people that really like that varietal Cabernet uh, quality, that the, the Vitor wines really delivers. Then I see a question here now that I open this up. Uh, Gros Verdot, um, it's, it's funny, you know, petite and gros, big and small uh, in French, but it is absolutely not related in any genetic way to uh, petite Verdot. Its clusters are, are about the same size as Cabernet, and the wine is, is fairly light. It makes a very spicy, um, um, more Pinot, Pinot of the Cabernet world. So it's one reason we've never used it in our Howe Mountain blend. It just doesn't really lend to it. We have a very small amount of Gros Verdot up there. And it was, we actually never intended on planting Gros Verdot, but we had somebody trade us. The, they wanted some of our St. Macaire cuttings. And so they had some Gros Verdot and they, we did a trade with them. And so we, now we have Gros Verdot and we make about a barrel a year. We actually bottled um, for our club members, one, one barrel, 25 cases. And it's really fun. It's a really fun wine to have. And it's, you know, one of those stumper wines you can take to a wine party and be like, what is this? I've never, nobody's ever had Grover Doe variety. <laughs> what are some of the other questions here? Uh, aging and, okay. So the great thing about um, now having 20 years of, of age on the wines is that I can talk to how well they age over 20 years. You know, when we first started off, people were like, how, how will these wines age for 10, 15 years? Like, well, I, I can give you a guess, but now I can actually tell you, you know, we've gone back. I'd say that our 2000 wines are starting to show uh, some bottle bouquet, um, you know, so that you're getting a little bit of that nuttiness. Uh, and then you get in 2001 and, and it's just slightly taking on nuttiness, but it's still a lot of primary fruit. So the way I like to describe age is, is like um, the, the tertiary aroma. So those are the aromas that come from bottle age. Those would be those sort of walnut dried or uh, woody type of aromas. Uh, secondary aromas are aromas that come from the winemaking process, you know, whether you age it in barrel, whether you put it through malolactic. And those primary flavors are from the grape. So I would say going back all the way to 2001, we're still probably 70% in the primary fruit flavors. And, and, and going up to, you know, I think you have to get to probably 
2010, where it was almost primary, still all primary fruit flavor. So these wines are really aging great. I had a 2003 last week and it was just lovely. It was sweet, dark, rich. You know, it, it, it wasn't taking on a lot of the bottle bouquet aromas. Like I said, maybe 20, 30% at most. Um, but that's, they're, they're, they're meant for the way we've built them. And of course, Howe Mountain being renowned for making wines of, of stature and being long lived and lots of tannins. That's what we're, you know, we're, we're sort of wanting to keep that um, uh, in our wines to make them true to our region, right? What Alyssa, was the... Alyssa, did you have a question? Alyssa Radubus. I see you coming in. Yes, Sean, um, we're looking at buying a 2018 large format bottle to save for a 21st birthday. So will a 2018 last 21 years? The big bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll last 21 years, especially in the larger format. So you get a little bit of extra time aging because you have more wine per surface area of the cork. So the magnums tend to have a little bit long, more longevity than 750s. So that's a great idea. We've done a lot of those for people, um, you know, for, for special occasions. Larger than a magnum? What's that? You have a larger than a magnum. Um, no, we don't, you know, because we, we same like a lot of Napa wineries, we use a mobile line and, and magnums are the largest format that'll fit on there. We do special, we'll do a special order, you know, for if you if you say the right word and know the right people, we, we can make a larger format bottle for you. So going up to the three, five, about six liters. So we have a special corker that right. comes in. You have to have a jaw that'll put that, um, squeeze that diameter of cork into a bottle. So. We I think I know the right people, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Uh, and then would the Mount Veter be a better one to purchase instead of the Howl Mountain? Yeah, I think that's a personal preference. You know, for me personally, I like the Howl Mountain wine just because, it, you know, we have a little bit more input in the wine and when, when we're crafting it and blending it and stuff. Uh, the Mount Veter wine is, is phenomenal. We, we tend to sell out of the Mount Veter wine quickly. It tends to get a few points higher score, you know, a um, little more scarcity on it. So we have a great following for the Mount Veter wine. It becomes sort of personal preference on what you like. Is it also a blend like your how? No, the, the Veter is 100% Cabernet. So that's also, it takes a different, um, there's, we have different fans that, that like wines that are either varietally Cabernet or that, that have, they like, they appreciate some of the blend. Okay, because I'm thinking the 100% Cab might last even better than the blend. I will put you guys in touch. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm good. <laughs> thank All you. All right, Sean, thank you so much. And uh, to all of you, I hope you guys are enjoying. We're going to move into our sixth Cabernet, and we're going to head just down the hill to Ralph Hurtlendi. Hey, Ian. How are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can see you. Uh, what? Uh, by the way, Sean. Um, yeah, go ahead. I know you're known for your Cabernet, but I really love your Merlot. I really do. <laughs> uh, I'm a Merlot guy. A lot of people, you know, they only look at Cabernet. I think uh, Merlot is a Ferrari in the wine world, but nobody wants to admit it because of that stupid movie that came out 16, 17 years ago. It's so passe, <laughs> but yet still so relevant. And it just drives me crazy. I'm like, have you ever heard of Petrus people? Have you ever heard of Cheval Blanc or Le Pen? Hello. <laughs> It's all Merlot people, but the, the, the beauty is that when you say Bordeaux, it, it doesn't have to be 75% of a certain varietal. So they just say Bordeaux and, and they have carte blanche by saying that. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Hi to everyone I know, Hector, Oleg, Greg, everyone. Uh, long time no see, been a couple of years, pandemic. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, welcome to Hawaii, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're all having a good time. Um, I'm Ralph Hertelendi. I am the founder and the winemaker at Hertelendi Vineyards. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, if you've never heard of me, it's no surprise. I only make about a thousand cases of wine a year. Really boutique, small production. Total, total production is a thousand cases. Some years, even less. In 2017, for example, I uh, lost 75% of my Cabernet in the fires. I called the pick on Saturday. They said we'll get it. To, we'll get to it on Monday because they couldn't. I couldn't get the crew in there, and then the fire started Sunday. So some years I made like four or five hundred cases. Um, and that's kind of just become our norm. Last year my vineyard was in the fires, and uh, I'm not making a cabernet. 
in 2020. So at the bottom left, you can see uh, my full lineup. Um, most wineries typically do one label and they just change the text, the font from Cabernet Sauvignon to Chardonnay or to Merlot and whatnot. I thought it'd be really cool to give every single wine that I produce a uh, different personality, a different story, just a different theme. It'd be fun. Why not uh, live a little bit on the on the edge? Live live on the dark side, Ian. You know you know all about that, right? <laughs> so uh, so for instance, the Chardonnay on the right, <clears throat> I did a Leonardo da Vinci theme, which I thought was really cool. Da Vinci used to write his journals backwards. In fact, that was his Da Vinci code. And so there's some gold text in the background that uh, I basically, long, long story short, I created my own Da Vinci code and I put a secret message in there. But even cooler, <clears throat> Ian, you'll like this. I was sipping on a Coors Light in a hot tub and um, all of a sudden the mountains turned blue. And I'm like, what is this technology all about? It's called thermochromic ink and you can change it, it can change color at whatever temperature you choose. So for my Chardonnay bottle exclusively, I decided why not have it change at the optimal serving temperature so no one has to ask me what temperature should I serve your Chardonnay at. Ah. The lions change color on the front of the label when they start tur turning purple. In fact, I'll show you, it's in my fridge, why not? Give me a second. <laughs> well, you are the last wine to eat, Ralph, so you can take as much time as you like here, but... Uh... Oh, I'm, right, I'm right here. Note, note to self, Ralph. You see this? Go last. You see this? <laughs> am, I, am I live, Ian, or no? You are live, buddy. I see you. All right. <laughs> the well, bottom's hard to see. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take off the slideshow. There we go. The lines are purple here. Yeah. Okay. And if I were to just uh, warm it up on one of them, oh, well, it's really, really cold. It's too cold, but it'll uh, go back to the black and white or black and white sketch. So. Just little fun things. I call them Easter eggs, uh, kind of afterthoughts after I produce the wine. I'm like, what else can I do to this label to make it extra special? So another thing I do is that I have another label on there that glows in the dark on the bottom right. Um, I don't know if you can see see this, Ian, but uh, I I'm going rogue here, Ian, sorry. Uh, oh, you are, you are definitely on a different path. Yeah, I've been drinking. <laughs> uh, this is my Adair, it glows in the dark and um, just little fun things. Uh, you don't you don't see this kind of stuff every day, but that's what Hurtalone is all about. It's, so it's all about the little details and then going above and beyond that because um, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I don't get much sleep because I lose a lot of sleep thinking about this uh, little small things that no one else thinks about. So a little bit about the Hurtalone history. Um, we, so Hertelini is my last name, it's Hungarian. My dad was born in Budapest and my ancestors have been making wines for the last 300 years that we could trace back to at least. Maybe more, but we could only go back to the 18th century. So uh, long story short, <laughs> thank you, Reed. Uh, long story short, uh, my dad caught the last boat out of Europe during World War II. Uh, he grew up on the East Coast, got his PhD at UC Berkeley, and I'm the first generation to revive that 300 year old family history. Uh, so it's in my DNA, it's in my blood. Uh, I was never an A student, C's get degrees, but I, have, I was born with the gift of a palate. That's pretty much it. Uh, so yeah, when I bought the little vineyard on the slopes of Hell Mountain, uh, Sean, I can't call it Hell, Hell Mountain because I'm 35 feet below the AVA line. Uh, but that's why Steve Burgess and I, sorry? Yeah, here comes the good news. I like I like yeah. this. So that's why Steve Burgess and I, we teamed up and we're going to actually define the gap between St. Helena and Hell Mountain. I'm like, this is premium terroir between 400 feet and 1400 feet, but it's just generic Napa Valley. We don't have an identity. Uh, this is like prime time. You got Seven Stones, Burgess, Bremer, uh, Via Dare, Somnium, Denica Patrick's my next door neighbor. I mean, a lot of who's who up there, but it's just like undefined generic Napa Valley. So. We teamed up and uh, we're gonna call it Crystal Springs. It has to have a historical relevance and there's a major historical relevance of Crystal Springs from the 1800s. So it's kind of a beautiful, you know, home run for you, Ian. It's a home run. It's a great salami for you, Ian, because you're a big you're a big Dodgers fan, I know. Yeah, are you gonna say Crystal Springs or Crystal Springs? I'll leave that up to you, my friend. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'll call it Crystal, but I know you'll call it Crystal. So there's no, there's no conversation. Uh, well, I already told you about me, so let's go to the next slide. 
I've been making wines for 15 years, not much to my story. I teamed up with Philip Titus from Chapelet. Uh, he's my he's my Yoda. He got the formal training. I've just been, I worked from the ground up. So I was a winemaker's assistant for Casey Flat Ranch. I worked for Del Dotto. I, I kind of just experienced, I, I learned through experience. I didn't get the UC Davis training. Um, I wish I did uh, in retrospect, but now at this point, it's like I've, I've been around the road, been around the block long enough for 15 years now that it's kind of too late um, to do it, to get what I want. It would just be pure, um, you know, inferiority complex fulfillment at that point. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Terroir. So I love mountain fruit. I love volcanic fr uh, fruit specifically. Uh, volcanic terroir is my favorite. Unbeknownst to me, it's in my, I'm hardwired to love it. It's in my DNA. My ancestors made wines in the only volcanic region of Hungary. Everyone knows Tokai on the eastern side of Hungary. Nobody knows Lake Balaton on the western side. It's the only Hungarian, or yeah, it's the only volcanic region of Hungary. And my ancestors were producing mostly white wine, uh, Surka Barat, which is like a Pinot Grigio and a Kekbialu, which is like, it's the only place in the world that grows that because it's not a, it doesn't self-pollinate. It's not a hermaphrodite. You need one row male and one row female to cross-pollinate. So it's not efficient. Everyone rips it out and plants a hermaphrodite like Riesling or something. Um, so I specialize in volcanic terroir, um, Pritchard Hill, Atlas Peak, Hell Mountain, just to name a few. And then my vineyard is uh, 11 yards uh, below Hell Mountain, which is Crystal Springs. Like what it. we're tasting here is a 2016 Cabernet. It's about 75, 76% Cab, 11% Petit Verdot. Terrence, I know you're gonna ask the question, so I'll just answer it before you ask it. Uh, I use a lot of Petit Verdot in this project because uh, of the anthocyanins. Uh, brings a lot of color and tannins, richness, but for me, it also brings a lot of that dark fruit. Black fruit, blue fruit compote, that kind of mixed berry compote to me, it's gorgeous. I love it. it bring, and I also get it riper than normal. So it's like that high heat. It's like that high heat um, on the mound, right, Ian? You got it. Yeah, it's, like, <laughs> it's a closer. Uh, so yeah. Um, into the middle school but oh ian cobble had a really great quote so i threw that in there uh master Sam ian cobble from the movie psalm said if, if putting this wine next to other reds is like sending shaquille o'neal into a middle school basketball game i thought that was hilarious for a master Sam to say that because it's so out of character so i i threw it in there but yeah you'll see consistently robert parker's a fan um most notably about this wine it won well, gold you're going at in the right direction dude look at every year you're getting a little better a little higher a little higher a little higher thank you cool. yeah consistent consistency um uh sunset international is big in la uh they gave it 99 points but uh tech Psalm and uh that that's run by master songs and masters of wine i got one goal at, at tech Psalm, so Kind of a big deal. Even cooler though is that my Merlot also won the gold at Tech Song that year, and Merlot gets no love. And I'm a Merlot guy. Like I think, I actually think as I've gotten older, I, I prefer Merlot over Cabernet Sauvignon. At we this just point. did stars of Merlot. Where were you? I don't know. I didn't get the nod. You didn't give me the invite. Oh, uh, I guess you weren't in the uh, the Merlot. Was index. I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I, I was indexing. Yeah, I wasn't cool enough. <laughs> <laughs> We, we just need to know who the Merlot players are. There's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's become a pretty shallow pond. So pretty good idea to enter. Well, um, this, this page just says that we give back. Um, I just threw it in there cause I think it's important to give back. Um, how was the 2018 vintage and when will it be available? Um, it won't be available till about a year from now. Uh, 18 actually was my favorite vintage of last decade. Uh, it, we had the longest hang time. Um, it's like roasting that per perfect marshmallow obnoxiously for much longer period of time than you, than you need to. We had, you know, we, we maximized, there, there was no, there were no heat spikes. The temperatures were all, always consistent, always cool, but you know, warm and I never really want temperatures above 100 degrees uh, and in 2018, it was just, it was perfect to me. To me, that was like the 82 Bordeaux. 
Well, uh, this wine is drinking beautifully. It is a big, hefty, mountain-style wine, and you have brought some beautiful uh, features. What is that? What are you doing to me? This is this is your live video. Are we gonna enter? <laughs> Enter into uh, uh, like some sort of a space shift paradigm. Watch. Yeah, out. I just broke the time space continuum. Exactly right. <laughs> space time continuum. There we go. Well, does anyone else have any questions? I really want to thank you guys for your time. I know it's getting late, so I don't want to keep you a bit. If you have any questions, feel free to just shoot me an email. I'll just throw my email in here in the chat. Um, just info at hurdleeny.com, and uh, that way everyone can go go to sleep or keep partying. But that way they're not just waiting on me. Um, thank you very much, Ian. Cheers. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Just Good seeing everyone. This was a great lineup, by thank the way. You. Yeah, it was a great lineup, and uh, we just want to give another plug to our charity. And Greg, thanks for being on the on the Zoom here. Uh, get in there and buy some wine from the charity. Uh, the emails in their inbox as well and the wineries each have a special opportunity and please just plan a trip somewhere for wine country and and hit these folks up visit them make new friends uh, we really appreciate all the wineries participating and uh, we hope that uh, we can do this in in person in 2022 we're we're working in that direction but we will continue to offer some really unique Zoom content. And uh, I'm excited about a couple of things that we have uh, been working on. So I'm just gonna share uh, our little Zoom into wine calendar that uh, we have here because you guys are still watching. Um, we have our annual uh, Barolo and Truffle next Wednesday. I've only got a couple truffles left. And the reason you wanna do it so that you can get the truffles delivered and then you can shave that stuff all over your turkey dinner that is a great way to do it i i'm, I'm literally these tr the truffles have gone catastrophic in price and uh, white truffles are now forty eight hundred dollars a pound um uh, that's up considerably over past years i've got a little bit of black truffle left but uh uh, the white truffle, very, very little. So if you want to join us for truffle, get involved, uh, sign up before Sunday. It might even be sold out before then. We've got my friend Dana Farner, fantastic lady of wine, hosting a session next Wednesday as I will be traveling. We uh, are going to Barolo and we're taking a group with us. Uh, so I've got a couple of friends hosting the Zooms while I'm gone. Dana doing Pinot Noir on the first, and my friend Matthew Kaner is going to be talking about uh, zero alcohol wine alternatives, and these are so cool. The more I learn about them, the more I think you'll be even in intrigued. And it's not about, uh, you know, I think wine people will love this because these wines are actually made like food with natural vinegars and and. Uh, and the ingredient list is just really f fascinating and uh you're gonna love this concept they're called proxies and it's a brand out of canada and it caught matthew's attention and he's getting behind it so i'm getting behind it too um so join matthew you can do either of these zooms for like 15 bucks a person and then we'll f uh, f uh do th a trifecta of awesomeness with uh mr paul hobbs hosting a zoom his name was mentioned a number of times tonight um paul will be live on the zoom with us december 15th talking about some of the great projects that he's taken on we're going to talk pinot noir we're going to talk wines of uh we're going to go to uh galicia uh spain and taste some godello with him and then we're going to go to armenia and taste some his armenian project and then we'll finish up with some Russian River Pinot Noir. So really uh, some fun events. I'd say some of our best that we've ever produced uh, on Zoom Into Wine. And that's the way we want to go out. So we're going to go out within a big bang in uh, December. Uh, we're going to do our first ever Stars of France. And the French wine list, which you do need to click over onto our newly developed Wine Cloud website to see the Stars of France. But uh, 
we're going to be going to all the great regions and tasting awesome examples from Burgundy, from Sancerre, from Bordeaux, Sauterne, Provence, Chateauneuf de Pop. So check out the wine list. It's sick. And I think you guys will really enjoy it. It's a great value. It's two days before uh, Christmas. And uh, we'd love to have you join us for the Stars of France. And I thank you guys for being with us tonight. Um, and thank you, Ralph, and everyone else on the Zoom. Hope you had a good time. And thank you to the charity, to all the winemakers, and to my team. We couldn't uh, do it without any of you guys involved. We're like spokes in the wheel. And um, it's uh, always better when we have more spokes and more folks. So thank you, guys. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Beautiful wine. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Pleasure.